are down here. So I found myself crouched on this alpine ridge line, asking myself, how did you get here? From my high vantage point, I looked off to my left upon miles and miles of bogs and black spruce forests, and to my right, to the majesty of the Alaska range of mountains. But at the moment, my attention was focused only about 30 to 40 feet in front of me, to the bull caribou stomping its hoof and flaring its nostrils in a pretty universal sign of being unhappy with the overall situation. Now, as I suggest, I was rather indisposed, and I would typically be enjoying this, you know, enjoying this moment, but it was Alaska late July, so it was sunny and a driving sleet storm, which made the whole situation even more surreal and frankly uncomfortable. As we continued our face-off, I combined a mixture of pleas and threats to try to get it to not charge me, and it was in that the most vulnerable of moments, I clearly remember asking myself, wondering aloud, how did you get here? The obvious present answer was that I was there to study dull sheep, to install camera traps to study their habitat use on military lands. But the more basic question I was asking myself was, how was it that I got myself into such a fully amazing and fully overwhelming situation? And it really, and later, after I was able to reflect on that question and after my pleas and threats to the caribou worked and they danced off, pranced off victoriously, I was able to reflect on that and it really came down to two rather different things. One was values and one was technology. Values in sense of my own personal values for wild places and wild species the same sort of personal values that led me into being a conservation biologist, and two, technology, because if it weren't for the new tech innovations we were using, I wouldn't be out there at all, putting out cameras to work for a full year on their own through negative 40 degree weather, taking a photo every hour on the hour 24 seven. Of course, this is pretty far from where I started uh, my interest in wildlife conservation back home in Texas, doing really cool teenage activities like leading senior citizens on birding field trips. But starting with a 30-year-old pair of bulky binoculars, I never anticipated that I'd go to then working with advanced camera systems and statistical models. But what I found throughout my career in wildlife conservation is that the use of innovative tech is actually pretty pervasive in wildlife and conservation biology. And that's allowing us to gather enormous and new forms of data on wildlife presence, movement, and survival. In the case of my work in Alaska, this meant capturing and going through over two million photos in about two years. Uh, mostly of nothing, though knowing when and where something is not can be just as valuable, which I guess is kind of a philosophical thing to look at. But some of the images that it did capture were rather stunning. From these images, we were able to give the managers on the ground detailed predictions on dull sheep activity and then also habitat, calculate habitat characteristics important for a whole community of alpine mammals from ground squirrels to grizzly bears. But if it weren't for the new tech we were using, we never would have been able to leave these cameras out here, out there working through such brutal conditions for such long periods of time. Besides scientific research, these new data are also allowing us to have a better visual conversation with the general public. They're a great teaching tool. Images like this are a great teaching tool and the emotions that they elicit in many of you when you see them is also your personal value for these species to exist for the sheer reason that they do exist. And then, of course, and the same values that led me into this career. Of course, some of these species we are, the public feel a particular pull for, these we term charismatic species, species such as wolves or polar bears or these guys, species that the public feel a particular pull and concern for. And, species, and despite this popularity, many of which that are endangered or declining in numbers. It just keeps, it just keeps looping. 
But I would imagine of all the charismatic species, many in this crowd would probably agree the tiger is probably the most charismatic species in the world. There's, and there's many reasons for that, right? They're strikingly beautiful, they're an awesome mascot, they're unquestionably powerful, uh, and for that primordial part of our brain, they can be a bit frightening. Seeing a tiger in the wild can actually be quite an exhilarating experience. One of my colleagues here at Clemson who grew up in and around the, of India's, throughout her childhood grew up in and around tiger, the India's tiger reserves, captures it pretty well when she described the moment, the mystic feeling of knowing a tiger is nearby. How you know that a tiger is approaching because of the prey fleeing and the birds and monkeys screaming in alarm. It's like a sphere of noise approaching you, followed by the silence of the people watching this clearly dominant animal, seemingly without a bother. It can be an spiritual, uh, such a, a spiritual moment as much as it is an exhilarating one. And yet, of course, we've now become perilously close to losing this species from the wild. Uh, in the early 1900s, it's estimated there are around 100,000 tigers stretching across much of their central to South Asian range, but they've been declining ever since. By the 1940s, the Bali tiger was extinct, and by the 1970s, the Caspian tiger was extinct, and we were down to 40,000 tigers. By the 80s, the Javan tiger was gone, and by the 90s, we were down to about 15,000 tigers. By, and then by 2010, 12 years ago, we were down to 3,200 tigers in the wild across all of Asia. And three of the remaining, 90, which meant a 97% population decline, and three of the nine subspecies were gone forever. Now, there are many reasons for this, of course. Poaching obviously being a big one. Habitat loss, also the massive loss of viable habitat for tigers and their prey, and then also human-tiger conflict the inevitable conflict that arises from people now living closer and closer to an apex predator. T uh, human tiger conflict is actually my main focus now at Clemson University. Uh, I'm working with the Tigers United University Consortium, which is a collective effort of these four universities that seemingly have something in common, and, uh, t and also the Global Tiger Forum and the Wildlife Institute of India. We're working on a new project in central India to deploy an even more advanced camera trap system that uses artificial intelligence. This AI camera developed by the Resolve organization has the real potential to be a game changer when it comes to wildlife conservation. That's because its onboard AI is trained to identify poachers and specific species of interest. The camera is then capable of sending those photos to patrolling rangers all within a matter of a minute or two. Meaning that patrolling rangers will have real-time information on wildlife locations and the presence of potential poachers. We are actually deploying these cameras in just a horrible place to work, you know, with a tiger range, beautiful area, sorry, uh, between the Kana and Pench tiger reserves of central India. This this corridor is about 80, 80, miles long, 80 miles long, but along this whole corridor that's so important for animal dispersal and mixing of populations is about 400 villages containing tens of thousands of people and livestock. Among other things, this leads to well over 500 to, 1, 000, to maybe even 1,000 livestock being killed every year, and then the retaliatory killing of some tigers by poachers and residents. However, despite this, however, despite the potential of losing their very livelihoods to this species, many in this region and across rural India still hold the tiger in great reverence, both culturally and spiritually. So not surprisingly, it's trying to solve these issues of human-tiger conflict and human-wildlife conflict can be quite difficult and complex. And even more so when areas some of the rural, range, rural areas and rangers lack some of the technological tools that are newer to help them prevent it. In fact, when some of my colleagues met with some of the rangers in some of the most remote areas that have the highest conflict, they told them, we were surprised you even know we had this problem out here. 
and that they had no idea this technology even existed. But now with these cameras, they'll be able to warn residents of a nearby tiger so they can move livestock and then intercede if they need to catch a poacher, poisoning carcasses and setting snares. This project's actually ongoing right now, but the early results are very promising for both preventing this conflict and for tiger conservation globally. So it's only through intervention, so interventions like this AI camera really give hope for the future of wildlife conservation, but it's only gonna be through large collaborative efforts, new innovations, and the public supporting organizations that protect wildlife populations and wildlife habitat that will be able to stymie this <laughs> decline in the glo world's global biodiversity. One bit of good news, uh, from that 3,200 number that I gave you before, uh, it was just estimated that tiger population is now at 41, around 4,000 tigers in the wild. So for the first time in well over 100 years, there's actually been an increase in the tiger population. Obviously, they are still critically endangered. We've lost a lot, and this is just the beginning. But this is, gives hope for the future of conservation in the area and shows that the decades of work that's already been happening is starting to show some promise in the tiger conservation, in tiger conservation. So it's, it's only going to be through these types of innovations that we'll be able to continue to support these wildlife populations and wildlife species. Thank you very much.